Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 11 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and joining me once again is my co-host, Parvez Ahmed. Thanks, Zaki. I'm so excited to be back. Looking forward to having our listeners listen in on the wonderful conversations that we had the last couple of weeks. Yeah, so so we've decided to mix things up a little bit yeah. for this episode. So what we wanted to do was focus on Muslim authors and really the diverse, uh, very interesting projects that uh, people from within the Muslim community are putting out into the world. So uh, we reached out to some, some very interesting people uh, over the past few weeks, as you said, and I wanted to start things off by uh, introing my interview with Aisha Mattu. Now, now Pervez, unfortunately, was not able... Uh, to participate in that interview, but but he was us there in spirit, uh, kind oh, of a, 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 a Mufasa esque figure. If you will. <laughs> so, That's right. No, so. I, I and I did listen to it and I enjoyed it and and just wanted to kind of um, sort of uh, uh, bounce back on what you said, um, you know, in terms of being able to feature these. Uh, I don't want to say up and coming, uh, you know, established writers and the need for Muslims from within the community to sort of tell our own, you know, tell our own stories, uh, tell our own nar- narratives. And that's always sort of a purpose of the show is to have people come on and tell their own nar- narratives in the form of oral history. But uh, here today, you know, with the, uh, with the interviews we've had, uh, we've been fortunate enough to have authors who are actually out there, uh, you know, putting, uh, putting pen to paper and uh, telling our stories. Yeah, or, or finger to keyboard, as it were, there you in, go. In, in the year 2014. But... <laughs> But uh, yeah, b- b- first up is, is my chat with, with Aisha Mattu, who is a writer, photographer, a philanthropy consultant, and board member of the Muslim Women's Fund. She's also a founding member for the Muslim Women's Fund, which is, uh, by the way, the first fund solely focused on serving 600 million Muslim women worldwide. Uh, she's raised millions of d- foundation dollars for global human rights issues over the past 12 years, and uh, through her work, she supports uh, issues including women's human rights, reproductive health, economic security, access to education, etc. So two years ago, she served as editor, uh, along with uh, Noura Maznavi, uh, of the book uh, Love Inshallah, which looked at the um, uh, the, the very uh, diverse uh, romantic lives of Muslim women. So the, earlier this year, she, she edited once again a book called Salam Love, which uh, presents those same stories, albeit from a Muslim male perspective. So, so kind of interesting. And uh, as I said, I, I reached out to her uh, fairly recently, and we had a very interesting conversation. So I wanted to go ahead and play that. So we're joined for this episode by Aisha Matu. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. So I guess just to start things off, before before we get into uh, the the two books that you have out right now, which are obviously generating a lot of controversy and interesting dialogue, and I want to talk about both of those things, uh, let's talk a little bit about your personal journey that brought you to this point where you uh, decided to put these books together. Sure. So um, the conception or idea for Love Inshallah, The Secret Love Lives of American Muslim Women, which is the first anthology, started about seven years ago. And my co-editor, Noura Masnavi, and I were sitting in a cafe here in San Francisco, where we both lived at the time. I'm talking about how, as Muslim women, we never saw ourselves reflected in uh, the media or in culture. And we really wanted to reflect um, a more nuanced idea and a more complex and more interesting idea of who Muslim women are. And one of the ways to do that, we thought, was to write narratives ourselves and invite uh, other Muslim women to join in to write their own stories. And we decided to focus in on the search for love because everybody loves a good love story And we are huge Jane Austen fans, and (laughs) it's a great way for people to connect heart-to-heart with a Muslim woman beyond the headlines. Mm -hmm. Um, So so the book came out in early 2012. Yes. How how far in advance did you uh, start 
the brainstorming process and and can you walk us through a little bit of how you decided on the final format for what it became Sure. So it came out in 2012, and we had actually been working on it for about five years before that. Oh, is that right? Okay. The idea came up um, five years prior, and we went through various iterations. About We did a national call for stories, and this was sort of pre-Facebook, Twitter. So we mm-hmm. used um, academic listservs, word of mouth, emails. You know, We sort of reached out to MSAs, all of that sort of thing. And we got half of the writers in the first call for stories, and we thought, okay, I think we're ready to um, approach an agent and see if we can move forward with this process. We actually got an agent fairly quickly after uh, reaching out to maybe a handful, and we're extremely excited, signed on, and she sent out our proposal to a dozen of the sort of top publishers and one by one, we got rejected by each and every one of them. And then wow. the cherry on top was that our agent dumped us after that. <laughs> so really? it, wow. was, yeah, it was sort of a relationship story in and of itself <laughs> of trying to find the right agent and the right publisher. And so we were really at a loss at that point, thinking, um, is this a uh, project uh, really worth it um, if an agent or publishers aren't seeing its potential um, are we too close to it you know have we sort of not um, thought this out so there was a lot of self-reflection self-doubt not sure of where we should go next at that point um, and at that point I was actually so happy that we were in it together because having um, a close friend a partner a co-editor we really I think um, pulled each other through the process. If I was feeling sort of um, less than positive or optimistic about uh, the process, then Nora would be the one who would sort of be upbeat and pull me through and be hopeful about it and vice versa. So we sort of persevered and the turning point was in 2010, um, in October, as part of uh, one of the nation's largest literary festivals, which happens here in the San Francisco Bay Area and it's called Litquake they were having something called Pitcha Palooza for the first time. And it was basically called, it's like an American idol for the literary set. So you have one minute to get up in front of a panel of industry judges, publishing industry judges and make your pitch. Wow. And so Nora and I prepared a pitch and she went up and she gave the pitch in one minute and we ended up being one of two winners that night. So there was a nonfiction and a fiction winner. Wow. And so we got this wonderful consultation with um, David Henry Sterry and Ariel Ekstedt, who also go by the name The Book Doctors. And they uh, looked over our proposal, gave us really wonderful insights and critiques on sort of how to make it a strong proposal. And once that was done, they said, we know um, we want to connect you to Soft Skull Press, give them this proposal. We think that this would be a good partnership potentially. And the editors at Soft Skull ended up falling in love with the book. And uh, at that point, the one thing that they asked was that we do, we double the number of contributions. And so we did another national call for stories. And uh, this time we did use Facebook and Twitter because enough time had sort of elapsed. (laughs) And and we got the sort of second set of writers at that point. So there's 25 writers in the first book. So um, you, you cover a wide range of topics, obviously, in terms of uh, the, the essays in, in, in both books, actually. But um, did you worry as far as, I mean, obviously, there there's a lot of uh, subject matter that uh, certainly uh, would, would be perceived as unorthodox, you know, if, if certainly when we're talking about uh, the broader Muslim uh, society, I guess. Did, did you worry about... Um, uh, offending people's sensibilities in, 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 in so far as that goes? Um, I don't think we worried about offending people's sensibilities. Um, Nora and I really strongly felt that our community was strong enough and mature enough and confident enough to engage with a more um, complex representation of the community. 
And when we published it in 2012, um, it was sort of after the 10 year anniversary for 9-11. And we really felt like there was a shift that for a decade, the community had been um, trying to represent itself as monolithically only one thing, which was mm-hmm. not a terrorist. Right. And, um, there felt like there was more openness now to say we've been so defensively facing outward and telling these stories repeatedly and that's fine and that civil rights work and everything is necessary but it's also time to face inwards towards each other as a very very complex and diverse community the most diverse muslim community in the world and begin to tell all of the other stories that have sort of been at the wayside and so yes there was definitely some pushback in response, but I would also say that there was an incredible embrace of the stories, almost like a sigh of relief um, from many, many women who said that they have had felt within the community and outside of the community a silencing of all of the different aspects of who they are and could be. And did you engage in any any kind of a culling process with the contributions that you got, or were you pretty much able to put to use um, all of the, the essays that were submitted? Uh, yeah, so we got over 200 submissions, and we had to uh, whittle it down to 25. And wow. our first sort of look at that was literary quality. So we really wanted an engaging story, a compelling story. Um, and our second was to try and do some kind of justice to such an incredibly diverse community. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was that was challenging, I mean, because ethnically, racially, um, geographically, age-wise, um, We also were one of the few anthologies, um, perhaps to this day, that really went out to welcome Muslims who identified as cultural and secular as well as orthodox. Um, So we really said that, you know, literary qualities are sort of first cut. And then after that, trying to do justice to all of this, provide a sort of a snapshot of the community and, um, we asked that writers who identified as American and Muslim, whatever those terms meant to them, um, were invited to and welcome to write for us. What What would you say uh, surprised you as you went through all of these uh, all of these uh, submissions? What were uh, What were some things that you learned that maybe you weren't prepared for or uh, weren't expecting? Well, one thing was just how unique each story was. So we received over 200 submissions and while thematically some of them might have been similar, they were all very unique experiences. And I think that really goes right to the idea of, you know, there are, you know, 1.6 billion Muslims in the world, half of whom are women and they're (laughs) constantly presented as a monolith. And yet even within these, you know, couple of hundred submissions and they were very obviously individuals Um, so there's that and also I think um, just the idea of being surprised um, by voices that were different from me so really that idea through storytelling I was able to connect to someone that I might not know I might not be in the same social circle or mosque circle as someone and yet I was able to hear an extremely intimate, vulnerable, beautiful, sometimes painful story and feel connected to see myself reflected in that person's story in some aspect. And uh, that gave me a great sense of sisterhood and solidarity. And, and as you've uh, gone and, uh, you know, you've taken the book around and you've met people uh, from across the country and presumably, you know, you've received correspondence across the world. I mean, what, uh, what kind of, uh, responses have you gotten i mean I, and and just to, just to contextualize this a little bit i i out of uh, as as i was prepping my notes i said well let me let me see what people say on amazon <laughs> and it's worth pointing out here the overwhelming majority of of reviews on amazon are are you know five star four star reviews but i i was I, I was intrigued by the the tenor of the the negative reviews you know people say nothing muslim about it terrible etc mm-hmm. i mean that that's got to be difficult for for you to to 
you know, I mean, this is a, this is a work that you've put a lot of uh, thought into, and certainly, uh, you you you're not approaching it in in a manner where you want to necessarily offend people. So, have you dealt with critiques like that in person? Because I mean, I think it's easy to to sort of disregard a, an anonymous anonymous uh, Amazon critic. Sure, um, and we don't disregard them. I mean, I feel like feedback is helpful, whether it's um, critical or supportive or, in some cases, both. Um, we definitely have um, close friends and counselors who have given us, uh, you know, both perspectives and said, you know, we like these aspects of the books, and yet these ones are troubling, and we've had some really great conversations around that. So I think we make it very clear in our uh, introduction that uh, it's not a theological book and it's hmm. certainly not a dating manual <laughs> and we hope no one's <laughs> that either. Um, you know, um, we began this project um, in the name of Al-Wadud, the loving. We began it with intention. We began it with huh. incredible love for our community. Uh, we began it, uh, we sort of see it almost as a, a mirror held up to the community um, one that shows its incredible beauty and diversity and complexity. So first of all, you know, I think it's important to know that it really came from an intentional space. Um, and that was one of um, great love and devotion to our community and wanting um, many more stories um, to be presented and for a more accurate and complex representation to be presented. But yes, I mean, I don't, I think that if, all of the reviews were four or five star reviews. I think that in itself would be problematic. Um, hmm. We want to have um, constructive dialogue and it's okay if some people um, do not appreciate either the collection or certain aspects of the collection. And it's when we get into those somewhat messy conversations, I think is when individual and community growth happens. Um, a number of those reviews did say they haven't even bothered to read the book. So I think right. notice yeah. that too. <laughs> <laughs> That's, you know, it's hard to take that critique seriously if someone hasn't even engaged, but for the people who actually engaged and said, we sat down to start reading or read through it and felt that it was un-Islamic or that certain of the stories or issues were un-Islamic, I guess I would say we need to have space to be, um, to be on this journey as an imperfect Muslim, to be on the journey as um, a human being who's in the process of being transformed. And it is those stories, and it has been those stories throughout our Muslim history that have inspired us. If you look at, you know, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and his story goes right down to uh, a depth of despair before it turns. Um, if you look at um, Hazrat Umar, he and his journey of transformation um, as someone who, um, you know, drank heavily and um, came to kill the Prophet وسلم, and was transformed and over the course of his lifetime became someone different. If you look at Mevlana Rumi or you look at Al-Ghazali or all of these stories that we tell each other, um, and particularly nowadays, the stories that we yearn to hear from convert Muslims, um, the autobiography of Malcolm X, it's his um, 89th birthday today. Right. Um, these are the stories that feed something deep in our soul about wanting to know that transformation is possible, that we live in messy complexity, and yet we continue reaching for something to become something greater than what we are today. And um, that's part of what we've tried to do with both of these collections, which is to say we're on a journey. It's many of us, especially in immigrant Muslim households, were taught you're either a perfect Muslim or you've fallen off the boat of Islam. Right. And I don't believe that. I believe we're all swimming in the ocean of Islam and that sometimes we're doing it better than at other times and that being more honest about that is actually going to enable more engagement and commitment to our faith, more wrestling with the faith. faith. It is meant to be a struggle. Jihad is um, embedded and folded into each of the five pillars, a struggle to become greater than what we are today. Right. 
do you do you find that by virtue of of having uh you know created a book like this uh you have people approaching you and sort of telling you their stories and in, in um, uh when you make personal appearances and things like that Absolutely that's one of the really really wonderful aspects is how many emails and conversations uh we've had uh from people who say I felt completely alone growing up um in a Muslim community I thought I was the only one who went through this um it's given me a sense of global sisterhood or brotherhood now that the second book Salam Love American Muslim Men on Love Sex and Intimacy has come out um I've also been taken aside by uh people who are not from the muslim community and first and foremost the book is meant for the muslim community but there mm-hmm. are other readers from other communities um who have taken us aside and said for example um with love and shala um i have never seen muslim fathers portrayed with such love huh. and that for her this was one of the recurring themes in the first book was how devoted and supportive Muslim fathers were of their daughters even when they didn't agree with um religiously or otherwise sometimes just emotionally didn't agree with their daughter's decisions and yet were still able to support them and find a way forward with them um and that was very you know that was a really wonderful insight for me it wasn't something that we had set out to do necessarily or or thought of when we read through it but this was what came across for this woman was that she constantly heard about negative depictions of muslim fathers and in reading this book she saw something completely different huh. now now you alluded to uh, the second anthology which is salam love american muslim men on love sex and intimacy and uh, i feel like this is a good segue to kind of uh, get into the uh, conversation about that book and more specifically um first of all how how did uh, at what point did did uh, you realize that you'd have an opportunity to do to do a companion book and what was sort of the impetus behind that it was funny because we had not thought of doing a second book um in the in the interim from when uh, love and shala was published my co-editor actually got married and moved to chicago and we were both going through some transitions and yet we kept hearing um both from muslim men and muslim women um that we should consider writing um or putting together a second anthology focused on men and it really just made us laugh because we said you know please men don't talk about their feelings <laughs> and that would be the shortest book ever and <laughs> you know it just seemed a little mind boggling to us and yet um the men especially kept sort of taking us aside at dinner parties sending us emails and just saying where are our stories and after a while because it was happening consistently we over the first year that love and shala came out especially we sort of had to just take a step back and think to ourselves um you know is it that you know do men actually have the space to uh express their feelings is that a space that they're given within the muslim community or the greater community and um if they don't have that space then perhaps we should try and create that space this idea of um equal leadership which i think is really important that this is a wom- women led and created platform and we are inviting men to join us there and have an equal voice mm-hmm. and you know it's something that i think is important for institutions um and organizations within the muslim community to really consider is like how do we do this when it's a male stage and we invite women onward so i think it was part of it was um demand and mm-hmm. interest from readers for that book and part of it was really wanting to see how does that type of partnership work in real life how do we play that out and so we it was a very condensed um uh call for stories uh timeline rather than than when compared to the first book mm-hmm. which would have been a five year process and um it really cultivating these relationships with our writers and we had basically a four five month turnaround with the second book um because we wanted it to come out two years after the first book and by the time we sort of started talking to a publisher and everything they said okay we can do it it's going to be tight but you need to send in the manuscript in five months wow 
that was challenging and fun. Um, so we did, again, national calls, really reached out, um, try to get as much of that diversity in as possible. Again, you know, sort of um, uh, ethnic, racial, sexual orientation, sectarian, um, geographic, all of that. So um, the men really stepped up. I mean, I think that one of the biggest differences uh, Nora and I noticed from the get-go was um, how open they were huh. about their relationships, their emotions, their journey. I had been fearful that five months would not be long enough because we'd be sort of, it'd be like pulling teeth trying to get the stories out. <laughs> uh, right. But that wasn't the case, really. From the first draft, it was sort of very clear that the story and the ability to dive deep were there. And with just maybe, you know, some edits or a little bit back and forth that the story would be developed um, enough to be published. Um, and um, so it was a very different experience with the women, I think, because it was so groundbreaking, it was the first of its kind. It was also the idea of women telling their intimate stories. And there is definitely um, a lot of silencing and shaming that can happen in the Muslim community or in any community when women speak up to talk about their experiences. And there were, even though there are norms for both genders within Muslim communities, um, I think men do still have more leeway. And mm -hmm. so Nora and I were definitely very surprised that men were sort of just willing to go there and say, yeah, I did have a relationship and this is what happened and here's how it played out. Um, in a in a much more open and direct way um, than the women writers had initially been. Wow. Well, uh, as as we sort of wrap things up, I mean, what's what's next for you? Are you, are you going to turn this into a trilogy, or do you want to uh, expand out into uh, different subject areas? Um, uh, we don't have plans for a trilogy right now. We do have <laughs> an ongoing uh, website where uh, people um, can submit their stories and have been submitting their stories for the last couple of years since the first book came out. Um, you know, we do the whole social media, Facebook, Twitter, all of that. We do have a lot of interest in a third book, um, but Nora and I are both sort of pursuing individual um, projects right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll see. I would love to work with her again. And I think that, you know, this is very much directed by our community of readers. And if the readers have a really, really strong interest in a specific book, then inshallah, we'll see what happens. Great. Well, where can uh, where can people find you online? So uh, www.loveinshallah.com. And uh, that's our website. And we welcome uh, stories, uh, submissions, poetry, fiction, nonfiction, and uh, at Love Inshallah um, for Twitter. And love, uh, we are also on Facebook if you look up Love Inshallah. And Salam Love are actually both there. Great. And of course, uh, both books are available on Amazon and uh, at most uh, booksellers. So uh, you can check those out as well. Uh, I want to thank you, Aisha, uh, for coming on and talking to us. A fascinating story. And I, I've, been, I've been wanting to uh, get your story for a while. So I really appreciate you taking the time for us. Thank you. It was such a pleasure speaking with you. And OK, we're back. And uh, yeah, but great conversation. And, and, and you know, kind of going back to what we said at the outset, uh, you know, having these interesting stories told, uh, certainly having men uh, open up talking about love and romance. Um, not, an, always an, not always an easy thing. Right, Zucky? Right. As two married men. Yeah. Very true. Uh, <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, uh, so uh, great conversation. Uh, we wish the best. Uh, and and with that, let's segue to our second interview for this episode. And uh, uh, this guest is Ali Etheraz, who uh, whose first book, Children of Dust, uh, hit shelves uh, five years ago. And he's back with uh, a new book that uh, that's due out very shortly after this episode drops called Falsities and Fibsians. And uh, just by way of background, Ali uh, grew up speaking Spanish in the Dominican Republic, then moved to Pakistan, where he attended both a rural school and eventually arrived in Brooklyn, from where he moved between 11 more states, ending up in California. Uh, he graduated uh, magna cum laude in philosophy from Emory in Atlanta and is a practicing lawyer by day. He currently lives uh, right down the street from the two of us here in the San Francisco Bay Area. 
and he's a, he's also an inha- in, in, inhabitant of uh, the San Francisco Writers Grotto, where he's at work diligently on his next project. So uh, this is the conversation that Pervez and I had with Ali Etraz. Let's go ahead and play that. Ali Etraz, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, guys. Uh, big fan. So uh, th- it's been five years since uh, Children of Dust came out, first book. Uh, five years later, exactly five years later, we have uh, Falsipides and Fibsians. Am I saying that right? Well done. <laughs> it's, a, it's a tongue twister. Yeah, made up. I, I let Zucky yeah, do, do the tongue twister because I don't know if I could make it through it. I made it. <laughs> you did? Yeah. Um, I'm wiping sweat off my brow right now, but I made it happen. Uh, so, so five years, was that the plan from the beginning? Um, no, it wasn't the plan. I mean, I definitely wanted to uh, write at some point after Children of Dust, but I also needed to get away from um, publishing and had to reorient myself and both artistically and as a person. Because that Children of Dust was 20, I was 27 years old, did the whole Terry Gross thing, Tavis Smiley, and it was all great. But, you know, there's there were really two options at that time um, to either try and sustain that sort of public, hey, I really want to be out there all the time attitude, or just to withdraw and be yourself. And Definitely the financial temptations are there to choose the first, but um, I didn't want to be that person, so I I kind of withdrew. I actually went off the internet entirely. I didn't even have it on my smartphone. I turned off my smartphone. Um, I did a lot of cleanse, and um, one of the interesting things about Children of Dust was that it sort of taught me that uh, well, let me back up. A lot of people say that you don't really know what you're written until it's subjected to like public scrutiny. And I felt that after Children of Dust was received by people, I had a better sense of what I had written. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I took away was that while religion gave me a great deal of solace over the course of my life, uh, because I was moving around a lot, like you, Pervez, um, it was something that I had as in my back pocket, you know, so you can go to a new town and, like, show up at the masjid, and it doesn't matter the kind of people there are, you have, like, Islam. So, you know, a lot of conversation about being Muslim is about, hey, how are the politics of it? Okay. But there's also the element of being Muslim, which is about how it is at a personal level, right? And... So there's political pan-Islamism. F that, like, I don't traffic in that. But I definitely trafficked in personal pan-Islamism, right? So, like, you go to one town and you are suddenly embraced by a very small but agreeable, generally agreeable community, except, like, when it's Eid or something. <laughs> um, and, and so in Children of Dust, I sort of realized that I no longer... W- felt that personal pan-Islamic connection anymore. Like there was something else there. And I had to kind of find it after I finished writing the book. And I knew what it was. I just wasn't willing to accept it. And it was it was writing. It was writing fiction and my poetry and my short stories and stuff, which I've been sitting on for a long time. So that cleanse happened after Children of Dust. And you know, cleansing can last a lifetime for some people. So for me, it's where it was a few years before I threw myself back into. Right. You felt you were ready to write again. Yeah. Uh, or explore a new direction. Um, so when the book, so uh, Children of Dust comes out, you alluded to the response from, let's call them mainstream circles. You were on the Tap Smiley show. You were on uh, Terry Gross. Um could you compare or perhaps contrast that like that reception to maybe some of the responses you got from within the Muslim community? I got great responses from within the Muslim community, and I knew I would. I always knew that I could be as myself as I wanted and not feel too much nonsense because I just w- was on the inside, if you will. Mm-hmm. So I went to a um, 
Children of Dust was selected as like required freshman reading at this college in Ohio, Wooster College. And I was sitting there like talking about it mm-hmm. to all the freshmen. And this girl like in the beginning was like, you write all this stuff that like not even Salman Rushdie would write. And yet like you're sitting here all laughing and joking about it. Like why isn't there a fatwa on your hand and all this other stuff? And I was like, because I am part of this conversation. Like, I yeah. have been in the Muslim life and community and activism and leadership and, you know, fellowship, fellowship for forever, you know? So, you, it's not like I came from nowhere and was like, yo, I have this to say and you guys have to deal with it. You know, like, I was saying this stuff at, in MSA mm-hmm. meetings. I, I so remember you, you had a certain amount of privilege by virtue of having nice. been a part of the conversation. Absolutely, you, yeah. absolutely. I mean, it's a privilege, but I mean, um, it's uh, it was earned. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I had street cred. That's right. Well, there it's, you go. It's, it's like there's that episode of The Office where Michael Scott does the Chris Rock routine uh-huh. uh, in in the office, and he he gets called out. Because somebody complains to corporate, and he's like, how come Chris Rock can do this routine? Uh, Everybody thinks it's groundbreaking, but I do it, and somebody complains to corporate. And it's like, well, because Chris Rock is part of the black community, so he gets to say what he wants. That's a good point, though, you make about, you know, sort of like the, yeah, Salman Rushdie and, and, and the, you know, you writing what you did. Or now, the, now, did the did you imagine you would be subject to that kind of a comparison with, yeah. I mean that, that must have been a surreal experience for you as an author um, so I got that comparison a lot and it's just, just because of the controversial aspect sure. mm. and I don't want it on the basis of controversy because that to me is like inauthentic if you want to compare you know pure literary skills like that's what I want to talk about that's right. right like I mean my my interest in this language called English, which has words in it. I mean, it's not about like how famous or how whatever you're considered, you know, in the establishment. Mm-hmm. It's about like turning that phrase, and you know, that's that's maybe some of like my poetry history or whatever, and certainly like my Urdu and Punjabi poetry history. Um, but whether someone's famous on the basis of like controversy or like who they know doesn't really mean much to me. Right. So, I, yeah. No, I, I was going to say, like, I think like you said earlier about political Islam, like you don't traffic in it. I think that that, that was perhaps, I don't know if it was a conscious decision or what, but you could have trafficked in that sort of... Hell yeah. Rushdie, yeah. Dude, like, cashed in a you, lot of paychecks. The, I was first amongst that group of people right. to potentially be a pundit. <laughs> and there you go. the conference circuit and... Um, the groupies and just the access that you get oh, yeah. it's unreal but you know that's not who I am yeah. and I hark back to like when I was a blogger and blogging was pretty cool because it was a window for me into myself and I was very unrestrained like I, if I were to blog now I would not start with that kind of honesty that I, mm. that I exhibited um, where, maybe where, was, where did that honesty come from? I don't know, man. Like, desperation uh, because I was, you know, working as a lawyer and I really had no outlet. Um, I was working a lot and it just... I, I didn't even think about it. Yeah. So, I never knew that. So you, 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 were, you worked as an attorney? Your yeah. background's in law. I, yeah. Oh, so we've had Kamran Basha in the past, so a lot of these, and hopefully in the future we'll have Wajahat Ali, and so all these sort of lawyers turn you know writers yeah um that's fascinating well, i mean i mean i i think i think the, the well i don't i don't appreciate the comparisons when, huh? oh i'm we're saying not all the same no 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 i didn't mean I, that i will have to sue that, you. <laughs> next you're gonna say they should have their own schools um, <laughs> uh, i mean i think the commonality is that yeah. you, you have a, a, a you have to have a command of language and, and there you appreciation go. for language. But I was going to say that maybe that says more about law and the practice of law in, in legal careers. No, it's, it's what it says about our community yeah. is that sure. mm. if you have a literary or like linguistic bent and you're trying to hoodwink your parents, <laughs> then you, you just become a lawyer, right? <laughs> Good point. So, In hindsight, that's probably what I should <laughs> Right. 
So, so uh, we, we've we've touched a little bit on on the journey towards the new book. Let's 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 get into the new book a little bit. Uh, where did it come from? And uh, uh, I have these badminton rackets for um, smacking the bugs away. Thank you. Yeah, we're, we're we're sitting outside yeah. in this, uh, the beautiful uh, palatial uh, ba- backyard here. So there's there's a few bugs. I was wondering what the what these badminton rackets were. Yeah. So, so, yeah, the new book, Falsipides and Fibsians. And so so when I was talking about blogging you know, a long time ago, and I thought about this when I was anticipating talking to you guys, the, the, I wrote an essay about power and beauty. <laughs> and um, it was just this notion that there, there's so much in our culture and our academia that <sighs> encourages us to look at the world and ha- construct a worldview which is built around either acquisition of or rejection of power, mm. okay? And then there is this, like, minor worldview, which is pursuit of the beautiful, the aesthetic, right? Mm. So I feel that, for me, Children of Dust is a sort of rejection of the imposition of power on me, and then Falsipides and other things that I've done, some of the poetry and some of my other short stories, uh, a, are a pursuit towards the aesthetic and the beautiful and that freedom that comes in in that pursuit, you know? And it's a pursuit which is so solitary that you can feel authentic doing it because you're not actually engaged in... You never oppress anyone doing it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, even when I was a quote-unquote blogger who was trying to do the right thing, like, I knew that I was going to be antagonizing people Mm -hmm. who who didn't agree with me. And I had to like be strong enough to do that, and I and I and I felt I was. But what I wanted to do was not to oppress anyone in the construction of my thing. Mm-hmm. My thing, you know, it's so falsities. It's just twelve short stories, and uh, some of them I revived from when I was a younger writer, uh, t- early twenties, and I rewrote them. Um, so. Uh, there's um, three or four stories, and actually, incidentally, um, they're all connected to being American Muslim or for American Western Muslim. Uh, there's one uh, called the Minotaur, which is about the Minotaur in Greek myth, mm-hmm. and he is, in the original version of the story, um, killed mm-hmm. by Theseus, right. yeah. uh, the blonde-haired Athenian, you know. So in mine, he's enslaved by Theseus and taken to Athens. And what happens when the Minotaur, this beast from the, you know, savage lands, is run, running amok in in Athens, like the fount of Western civilization? Right. So I have this other story, the lawyer of Islamistan, about a future Islamic state, a caliphate, actually, where the caliph's wife is chosen through, like, a, a bachelor-style show, um, and uh, there is a you know department of jihad, both offensive and spiritual, and uh, and so there is a lawyer who is who gets caught up in a crazy trial, and uh, there's another story about um, post 9/11 dragnet actually in New York City, mm-hmm. which uh, I I felt very you know keen to write, and it was one of my earlier stories as well, and I rewrote it and. And I, and I do. I take a very untraditional route in all of this. I mean, sur- these are all surrealist stories, and yeah. Western surrealism is a touchstone here. And Western surrealism, um, it's about you know, it's about being traditional but flipping it on its head at the same time. Right. Because you're also talking. You, you bring up character. I mean, you, you mentioned some of the characters from Western mythology, but there's certainly a lot of Eastern mysticism mm-hmm. and mis- you know, and mythology there as well. Yeah. Right? Um, I, tell us a little bit about the about the title. Right. So I uh, the title at the moment is a mystery because there's a contest oh. as to who can figure out what it means. So uh, on October second at my book launch in Mountain View, mm-hmm. um, seven thirty p.m. at Books Inc. Please, uh, you guys are more than welcome. Um, y- you know we will reveal it, but it is connected to. To give a hint, it is connected to you know this whole surrealist uh, versus um, Islamic connection, and it's cool that you picked up on that um, Eastern storyline. You know, uh, 
I, I, some of my life, I grew up in the American South and, you know, West, uh, Western Gothic and, you know, Southern Gothic is a very big, you know, Faulknerian kind of. And so my, my story about the gin in yeah. the story it could, could be set in, in Alabama. <laughs> you know, it's got that fantastical sort of Southern attitude to it. And, and so, I mean, this is an experimental book. I mean, it's short stories. I, um, no super, super big press would have touched it. It's kind of like in film, you know, like you can do Captain uh, America or you can do like Melancholia or something. Sure. You know? um, and so this is like my version of like re- Irreversible, that right. the Monica Bellucci crazy film. Uh, well, in, in Hollywood, there's the sense that if you're if you're a big star, you do one for them and one for you. I think the same way. Yeah, yeah. I probably do like two for myself because it's it's writing. You yeah. know, it's not yeah. as taxing as I guess a film. Yeah. So, but I definitely believe in, in that because it's like music, right? Like like one of the bands Black Keys that I followed for a while, like they quote unquote sold out, but five five albums before that they did indie. Right. There's some of the most awesome like new blues like rock that has come around the last 20 years. Um, Hip hop is the same thing. I don't see why we have to be any different as writers. Um, <laughs> well, and, and I mean, there's there's something inherently. I mean, there's there's something pejorative about this idea of selling out, right? I mm-hmm. mean, I think I think you can make something for a wide audience that's still reflective of your own identity and your own voice. You know, that's right. I feel like I did that with Children of Dust, you know? I, I, I felt I was lucky. I felt that I was able to get onto that scene and be completely true to myself in expression. And, like, again, this is one of those things, like, I was in the right moment in time, early 20s, uh, mid-20s, when you were just ready to be a little crazy and have mm-hmm. the courage to do it. You know, if you give me that chance again, I, will, will I have the same courage and same, like, balls to just express myself I don't know you know that's that's the question I'm asking myself but and even with the blogging I think you know we were talking about this before we uh, we went live but um you know you start writing at a time where that was a new thing that was new media right that was the new like the newest thing and so now if you were to revisit that uh like you said not only would you maybe not have would you not talk about the things or be as personal as you were? Um, but you know, who knows how the response would have been? The executive response was very different back, back, back then. Um, but I, you know, I, again, going. Uh, but I really want to talk about maybe some of your inspirations, like who, who you like reading. You talked about the American South. You talked about uh, Faulkner. Um, who do you like? I mean, who do you read, or who? What were some of the inspirations behind uh, falsities? So, um, I guess there's, there's two answers, you know, there's a stylistic answer, and so for Children of Dust, you know, Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, Al-Ghazali's Munkid, uh, uh, Deliverance from um, Error, mm-hmm. uh, Al-Mutanabbi a little bit, some mm-hmm. of his um, life story as opposed to his, he wasn't a biographical person. Um, and, and, and so that's stylistic, I mean, that's structural, it gave me a sense of how to do my version, you know, Muhammad Asad, you know, yeah. something like that. Right. But at the same time, uh, and so with falsities, like the stylistic background would be Italo Calvino, Italian fabulist, um, um, Kafka, mm. uh, Borges, um, some of the newer writers like Ben Marcus, and um, there's a, a wonderful um, collection. There's a it's a journal called like a fairy tale review. You know, they do interpretations of myth all across uh, but then there's sort of like a second answer which which is writing itself is um, my it's inspiration you know it's it's a form of worship mm-hmm. like literally I mean it what is your salat is my art like it's at that level of inspiration so uh, you know you feel like a sense of um, cohesiveness and so I think that you can have all the great ambitious inspirers, you know, coming at you and you can stack their books up and stuff. But like when you're engaging with the work, like what is it that is going to carry you mm. to do it? So the rigor and the intensity I feel like I get from writing as a worship, hmm. an act of worship. Yeah. 
Um, in, in terms of, and I'm sure you've gotten this question before, but uh, the, the, this is, uh, you know, the creative fields just in general are, are relatively uh, a new terrain for, for uh, the Muslim community, especially um, among uh, the youth in the community. So uh, what, what pieces of advice uh, would you offer to people who, who want to break in, not only break into this field, but uh, sort of navigate the, uh, some of the areas uh, that you've, you've had to navigate or, or been uh, privileged to navigate, I guess? Yeah, definitely privileged. I mean, it's it's uh, again, it's like an earned thing because you just don't fall into the creative field, and you guys know this. I mean, it's we're sitting here on a weeknight, you know, trying to make a podcast, like uh, after working all day. So, um, I mean, I, I guess the the first question I, I always feel, and I, and I took some notes about this uh, because I, I felt that it would it'd be like relevant, and and, and I'm glad that we're doing this because. Um, uh, it's, there's very few Muslim outlets, you know, Muslim community outlets, and so it's always nice. So, I mean, I appreciate that actually. There is something. Um, what I've noticed is that there's something performative about being a Muslim in America, hmm. and so you know, you on one hand you want to be taken as an individual, mm-hmm. but on the other hand you accept and you're kind of made to accept that uh, being characterized as a Muslim. Uh, whatever that might mean, right? Because for some people, it's a theological thing, and for some people, it's like a cultural thing. Mm. Um, whatever that means, like you, you, as long as you have a Muslim-sounding name in the mainstream, you are a Muslim in in, in the United States, mm-hmm. right? So it doesn't matter what our theolo- our respective theologies are, and I know for a fact that our theologies differ widely. But we are still constructed to be Muslims together. And that something is bigger than us, right? Mm-hmm. So on, on each of our individual um, lives, we're, we're trying to navigate that co- connection between our individuality and our like construction from the outside. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I learned my lesson in the 20s. And I told myself I refuse to be a performer, right? I refuse to like perform Islam as an act to commodify it, whatever, and turn it into, like, a tool for myself. Hmm. But then at the same time, like, it kept happening to me, right? So I have a book called A Portrait of a Muslim as a Young Man, and I have to go on a podcast that are promoted because they're about Muslims. And when I go on a big show, then they're like, oh, the Muslim guy is here, right? So, I mean, how do you navigate that performative aspect? And I think all of us are grappling with that in mm-hmm. our own way. Um, I think I think Arslan Iftikhar has copywritten the Muslim guy phrase. Oh, there's someone who is the Muslim guy. Well, there you go. Well, just, is he the Muslim guy or he's, is he Muslim? he's the Muslim guy? <laughs> okay. So. Well, right. Like you know that that doesn't surprise me. We're maybe foregoing the opportunity to get him on the show. Um, but <laughs> but uh, we love no, Arslan. Yeah, yeah. No, but you know, well, I I couldn't help but from what you were talking about, think of, like, like Du Bois talks about this in the conscious of being yes. black and double consciousness, yeah. right? I mean, where's that... I mean, you're obviously familiar with that, but is that what you're, what you're kind of dealing, you know, t- talking about there? The struggle to be Muslim and at the same time the struggle against the pitfalls or the perceptions of is, being Muslim? Is, is, is there a sense that... And sorry, I don't mean to mm-hmm. Is there a sense that you're being held to society's impression of what quote unquote Muslimness is versus your own personal definition. And by society it could be non Muslim society as well as your own Muslim community. Well, I mean whatever the yeah. whoever the uh, audience, the audience of the is. book is. The audience is. No, or not just the book, but like you said the performance. The, the audience aspect. of the yeah, performance. Of the performance. Yes, to all of that. You are held to all of those standards. Absolutely. And um, you you know so what I decided to do, what I decided to do was just say screw it, like literally. Because I had a guy at my first book reading, Children of Dust, Asia Society. I remember it clearly. It was my first time ever in New York at a big, big event. And um, he goes, you know, um, what would happen if you were appropriated and your work is like used for like, you know, nefarious purposes and stuff? 
And I gave him the politically correct answer, which was that I refuse to be appropriated. No one, you know. But the real answer was that I can't be appropriated, right? Because I'm too weird. I'm too original. I'm too like creating my own narrative. And so all these questions about like how do you answer performance, like this this expectation of performance, you just do it by like being as truly you as you can muster, mm, right? right? And if at if still like you people can people at that point won't think of you as a performer. That's what will happen. That, but the problem is that we're too often seeking the spotlight. Because there are places where if you act, you can fit, right? And it's, it's dude, it's just like high school, right? Yeah, yeah. Like if you act a certain way, you can get to like the cheerleader and student body president. But if you just act like yourself, you're gonna have a pretty good time in high school. And that's really all I see it as: is how true can you be to what you want to pursue? And there's way, there's a lot of temptations. I mean, Shadi Hamid, temptation of power. I'm gonna put that. There's a temptation of, of culture, right? Culture is always tempting at you as well. Right. And, uh, you know, you can play the jester and you can play the foreman and you can play like the, you know, the hawk. You can play like the dissident. But, like, you will know that you're playing. Mm. So I don't want to, like, play for other people. I just want to play for myself. And, and so that mm. is where it's at, like, for all of us, I think. So true. Yeah. And, and I mean, and what I love is, I mean... I mean, you're responding to a question perhaps about the book or about you as a writer, but what you're saying, I mean, intentionally so, I would imagine, is just life as a Muslim in America, right, in our communities. And so that's, I mean, that, that part of it I find so fascinating, you know, just because one, I can relate to it, I can't relate to it as a Muslim writer because I'm not one, but I can certainly relate to it in terms of the performance aspect of living in a, in a community. Um, that's yeah. That 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 is fascinating. Now, like just from you going back to your experiences in living in big cities, small communities, etc. Um, does it is it different? Does it does it does it get easier? Does it get less you know fake uh, in, in 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 different contexts? You know, uh, or, I'm glad you brought up Pakistan too. Yeah. Is it different there? Um, I'm glad you brought up the the black um, intellectual example because right. James Baldwin. A um, couple of decades after Du Bois um, grappled with this, and he said, "Where can I be authentic? Like, can I go to a big city and be authentic? Can I go to Paris and and and, and eat up Western civilization? Will I feel authentic then? Mm. You know." And then some of the, his um, his um, contemporaries they went to Africa, mm. right? And uh, and I and I'm sorry for getting this wrong. I think it's Richard Wright who. Uh, went to uh, Central Africa and mm-hmm. the State Department then wouldn't let him travel back and there was like all this communist conspiracy mongering and anyway they were all trying to find the right place and in Children of Dust I, I have that experience right in Pakistan where I'm like wait am I am I most authentic here yeah. right I can't, where, where am I capable of being most authentic and and I think the answer is you can't be authentic anywhere if you are going to be inauthentic then it will be inauthenticity will be something that pursues you all the time. And whether that's in a mosque and of compose of people who think exactly like you, or if that's in a place where everyone is like out to get you, you can be inauthentic. So I think that's that's the whole like jihad of the nafs thing, right? Like yeah. that I think is where we're pursuing authenticity. So I feel pretty authentic talking to you guys, right? But I, I also know that that's that's a conscious effort on all of our parts to create that bubble of authenticity, and if if I don't think that you uh, help me with that, then I won't include you in it. That's kind of a it's sort of cruel, I think, because that means you're kind of a jerk at times. <laughs> but um, well, but there but there's self preservation yeah there to an extent, right? And I think that motivates most people. Yeah yeah. True. I like that. We can do. Um, this is, I mean, this is a fascinating conversation. So, I mean, uh, trying to blank. So, uh, so have, I, I can actually read you a section from a uh, very small section from Fal- Falsipides, and um, it, it's it's connected to this question of authenticity and where you fit in. So, uh, just the backdrop is that this painter 
Zaki, you're a painter, so now this is, the story is about you. Um, <laughs> he leaves. Well, let me let me read it to you. A lawyer turned painter in his early 30s, twice divorced. He had come to the Persian Gulf after his first and only exhibition in New York. A series of surrealist self-portraits juxtaposed with the faces of suicide bombers had gotten reviewed by the papers not on the basis of artistic merit, but whether they might be useful in reducing the radicalization of Muslim males. None of the paintings sold. The final straw came when the State Department offered to take him to at-risk Muslims around the world and fix them. Shamed and broke, he fled America and took a job with the Bahrain Foundation for the Arts. If he was going to be a state-sponsored artist, it would be for a foreign country. So it's, you know, this guy has got this authenticity issue, but right. he escapes it and then he finds himself beholden to a new set of chains where his authenticity is, you know, sacrificed. So story is not about that question, but it crept up, Certainly, you know, yeah. in this paragraph. I mean, stories about, like, love and adultery and, and such. <laughs> Islamic topics. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, we talked about the, um, we, we talked about the title a little bit, uh, and, and, and we'll make sure that whenever the, the, the secret is out, we'll put a link, uh, you, know, oh, yeah. and, you know, on our Facebook page. Uh, post October second, uh, tell us about the cover because it's a beautiful cover. Yeah. Uh, it, it's it's uh, I'm sure has a lot of profundity and meaning there. So it's it's a it's a it's a, on the cover. There's a there's a young lady who is um, reaching um, her hands are reaching towards a wine bottle, um, but her face is looking away. Uh, good and question. She's looking there's a there's I think that's the source of light in the room. I don't know if that means anything. But. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, it's a beautiful painting. I mean, it's by Komele Jazuddin, a up-and-coming Pakistani painter. Mm. And it's called Lawn Ad Hide the Booze. And um, the backstory on this is, I mean, it just occurred to me that there's backstory beyond me being like, hey, Komele, I really like that painting. Um, the um, there's a woman in Philadelphia who runs um, Twelve Gates Arts, which is a art gallery for South Asian art, and her name is Aisha Zia Khan. Mm-hmm. She introduced me to Komail's work, um, and he traffics in sort of Christian devotional styles from like the 17th century, but merging them with like Shia and and Islamic theological motifs. So th- this wow. is not this is not from that family, but his other stuff is. Um, and, but the back story further on this particular image is that I once wrote an essay called The Whore's Last Sigh. And it was about um, a reading of the idea of the whore in the Quran uh, as inspired by the, the paintings of uh, the photography of Shirin Nishat, an Iranian feminist, you know, sort of structuralist uh, Photographer, mm-hmm. and there's a woman who's wearing an, a, a hijab, and she's got like a, a gun in the middle of her face, and then she's got calligraphy all over her face. Mm. It's striking imagery. I mean, her whole series is just fascinating. Yeah, that sounds so familiar. Yeah. So I wrote this like kind of po- poetic essay, and um, I wanted to turn that into a story. So there is a sort of supernatural story in here called the Hunter of Virgins. And there's a scene involving wine in that. So it links to this painting. Mm -hmm. So it's this this composite. I I got to choose my, I didn't get to choose my own cover in Children of Dust. I would, you know, I got to choose this. I wanted to be able to have meaning. It's like how we give our kids names that have like a lot of meaning, right? (laughs) So um, that's that's the backstory on this uh, awesome painting by Komela Jazuddin. Mm, It's, it, like, it reminds me of like paintings I've seen of. Uh, like some of Mirza, like Mirza Khalid's, uh poetry. I don't know why, but you know. Because you know, there's that um, sort of miniaturist element to his work, and it's kind of prevalent in a lot of uh, contemporary Pakistani art. When you say uh, his work, you mean Komel's. Oh, good, right. Uh, uh, and so, so they're sort of borrowing from how the old, like 19th century Mughal era paintings That's were. Right. You know, the colors are similar, and there's some influence there. And shadow some, work. Yeah. Shadow work, yeah. yeah. And, so, and people should definitely be like writing about this and observing this. I'm glad you're picking it up. And right. um, in a in a in a world where a lot of times we're just like 
you know, like comics and celebrities, like there's another range of images and, and work out there. And, and I'm glad that, you know, in this book, I was able to sort of give a shout out to them. Mm. So what's on the, um, what's on the horizon for Elia Duras? Um, doing as few podcasts as possible. <laughs> man, it's, uh, I got nervous, you know, when, when Zaki was like, oh yeah, let's do a long podcast about you. <laughs> but I think that I, I have had a few things going. I did a, uh, nonfiction essay about, uh, Nastalik script, which is the old Urdu script or the usual Urdu script and how a modern technology is influencing it and changing it. Um, and I got involved with this um, um, narrative nonfiction journal called Craftsmanship, where we profile uh, leading artisans in the world. And so uh, the inspiration comes from um, this uh, essay that Todd, uh, this article that Todd Oppenheimer wrote for The New Yorker about um, a knife maker. And he uh, found the guy who has discovered the secret behind the, the Damascus blade the old Islamic Damascus blade that was, like, invincible. Mm. So there's a guy in Florida who is the keeper of the old Islamic secret. Mm. So um, that article goes into that. So I am actually writing an article about a cricket bat maker and uh, who's, like, a leading exponent of this new form of cricket bat making, and I'm doing another one on miswaks and awesome. the revolution in miswak industry. <laughs> uh, which is the wooden toothbrush, right? For those and um, and it's actually going to be a personal essay, so we'll see how that pans out. Mm. Um, I started experimenting with the the Urdu ghazal in English, so Aga Shahid Ali and some of those um, descendants of that literary tradition. Um, and there's a Pakistani American poet who unfortunately passed away at the age of 28 about 10 years ago, and he was extremely avant garde. Uh, and so I, I, I will be coming back to you guys when I sort of am done editing his corpus of poetry, which is currently in my hands from his estate. Wow. And um, he wrote in Urdu. Or in he wrote in English, and okay. he has actually like it's really interesting. You know how like we over the last fifteen years became like more Desi or more Muslim or more like aware of our cultural backgrounds. So he grew up in the eighties and nineties, and he had no nine eleven experience. Right. So he was like wow. extremely like mainstream because that's all he knew to be. Wow. Right? And so his avant-garde pursuit doesn't even like navigate itself through Islam or his identity as a Pakistani American or a Kashmir. He's a Kashmiri American and they have a great poetic, you know, legacy going on. Right. Um, And so I'm very fascinated to like dip into this world where he just directly goes to like 19th century French uh, poetry and he's like, I am its like, you know, uh, descendant. Mm -hmm. And for like a Kashmiri American, American born like kid who's like mid twenties to do that, it's almost inconceivable for us in the post nine eleven world. But he was doing that, right. and um, and so I'm I'm very excited to to edit that that volume, and I hope I can make a volume out of it because uh, at this point we just have a bunch of poems. Mm. So um, okay. at some point I'll I'll turn to other literary things, but uh, you know there's enough on my plate right now. So anything interesting that you're reading right now that you'd love to share? Um, actually, yeah, uh, I'm reading, I'm reading a couple of things that I really enjoyed. One is a novel called The Walking by Lale Khadivi. And I hope I'm saying her name good because, uh, I, I've never heard it pronounced, but it's about Kurdish American experience mm. via Iran. It's actually a trilogy and, uh, it's the second book. And the first one was set in like, 20th century Iran, early 20th century Iran, and the Kurdish experience. Uh, it's a very, very well written work, and um, and then you know I'm reading like my my James Baldwin's and my Marianne Moore's and early like American poetry like Walt Whitman, right. and um, I feel like I'm at that place where I'm engaging with just Americana on its face, cool. and I want to see like what it means to me. So. Yeah, no, be fun. I, I love that phase. Yeah, I mean, I, or yeah, I, I, did, I did my own period of just reading uh, that period of America, like you said, Americana. So yeah, a lot of Faulkner and yeah, and, uh, yeah. So that's that, that, that's that's great to hear. Um, in, in terms of uh, out there on the scene, um, 
any sort of up and coming kind of Indian Pakistani American writers that you like or have read? Like, uh, there's uh, American Dervish or. Uh, well, I mean, that, uh, Ayad, he's yeah. beyond up and coming. I mean, a lot of right. these guys are um, or, pretty, uh, pretty well established. Uh, reluctant fundamentalist, again, and bad things. Most of them, yeah. yeah. Uh, he's, he's great. I mean, I really enjoyed Reluctant Fundamentalist. I, um, him, right? I, I just thought that question of the Janissary was just fascinating, where, you know, so Mohsen Hamid, and he's not, like, in the same space as you and me. Like, we're American Muslims, and we're attached to the, like, edifice of Washington, D.C., and New York, and L.A., right? Whereas he is, he divested himself, right? right? He, first of all, he was from Pakistan. He came here for education, That's and right. he, he had the opportunity to go back. Like, we can't go back. We don't have any land in the homeland, right? If that's, I think it's about land. If you have land in a place you can go to then that is not America, then I think you, you'll consider that option. But if you don't have it, this is where you're going to find or seek your land. Okay. And, um, you know, that's what we're all doing. Like, we're going to buy a house, and then once you buy a house, you're like, dude, I'm American. <laughs> like, well, I don't have any other options. Okay. You know, so um, that little search for a strip of land I think animates a lot of us and we like to think that it's different somehow in the west but it's not I mean it's the whole like old Punjabi like mentality like where's your land <laughs> like that's where you're from right yeah. so so did I, I didn't answer your question at all but no, no, you were talking I'm about reading uh, yeah. I'm, I'm reading uh, uh, I'm reading a lot of poetry these days so um Oh, actually, I read like six Iranian novels in a row. So that's what I've been reading. Okay. And I was supposed to write something about them, but I just haven't. Um, Dina Nairi has a, has a couple of, has, has a great novel about Iranian revolution and, and especially the female experience in that time. Mm. Um, she's an she's a extremely kind writer. Um, I, I really strongly recommend that book. Um, and, um, Have you read The Mantle of the Prophet by... Uh, oh, yeah, a long time ago. Okay. My, um, Reminded me when you said about the Iranian Revolution. Yeah. My Children of Dust received a review from uh, Murad Kalam, okay. who compared it to Mantle of the Prophet, which I thought was supremely ambitious and gracious. Uh, Roy Mutahidi, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, Fascinating, really. But I, I read Mental the Prophet okay. in the 90s, man. Me too, yeah. yeah. So it's been that, that was a good time for it, right? <laughs> it was. Yeah. yeah. I would like to revisit that, but... Um, Me too. Yeah. There, there's some good... Um, there was some good... There's some good up-and-coming writing. I, I see it. Mm. You know, I feel like some of these kids are, like, starting to find their voice. Um, just like, you know, we'll continue to find our voices and... Um, and it'll be interesting to see whether it materializes in, in poetry more so, whether because spoken word has has it. You know, the spoken word scene is, is pretty lively. Um, and you know, I like to see it in in, in theater. Mm. You know, where where is like the Broadway play? You know, like about our experiences. Like I, I think this it's right around the corner. Somebody's going to do that. So yeah. well, it's exciting to live in a time where we're actually. You know, no, no longer just talking about cultural production, as it were, but actually doing something and doing stuff. And there's a lot of storytellers out there. Yeah, and it's good to see. We're telling our stories. And it's kind of a group thing where we sort of all have to support each other, mm. you know. And uh, I, I was always, uh, res not resentful, but a little upset that some of the established people when I was coming up wouldn't really help out the... Mm kids that right. were trying to make it and and I have always sort of had an open door policy. I mean there's a lot of people that felt that I reached out to and, and so I felt that I should pay it back you know <laughs> and so anytime like people want to write for whatever and want to consult like I've been down for you know so um, I think that, that that's really true you know I mean it's uh, the, that's been my experience too just in terms of every step forward I've been able to take has been because of somebody uh, who really didn't need to. Yeah, uh, but was gracious enough being to. Being gracious yeah, enough absolutely. to, you know, and and uh, I, I think that's uh, that's necessary, you know, and and I think I think there is, there does tend to be uh, uh, a certain amount of short sightedness among people who are who try to hoard 
what they perceive as, as an advantage or whatnot. And I think I think in the long run that's that's damaging. It is, and it's 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 one of those things, right? There's people who create like an edifice of themselves, and then there's people who kind of create a canal, and then they go rowing in the canal around each other. And I think that's more fun. I mean, that's what art, art diffused congruence, right? That's what art is supposed to be. Thank you. Um, <laughs> So, we, we meant it that way. I know, I know you did. That's how I, it's been leading up to this interview. <laughs> yeah, it's the whole like, am I am I going to be like Venice or am I going to be like Alcatraz or whatever, right? So, so yeah, buy my book and then we can right. create more congruences with each other. So, Falsipides yeah. and Fibsians. Yes, comes out when? Uh, October second is the official launch date. But it's actually available now, kind of under the... T- it's available. Okay. And so once it's out there, people will build, get it off of Amazon. Yes, sir. And all yes, sir. Although, although uh, patronize your, your right. local bookstore as much right. as possible. Support uh, brick-and-mortar dealers That's yeah. right. uh, That's right. uh, yeah. when, whenever possible. And, and uh, for, for Bay Area people, uh, you will be signing the book? Uh, in Mountain View and also in, uh, at Lit Crawl on, in Valencia and the Mission. And uh, we'll announce my, like, other trips wherever. But one thing I wanted to add was that I have this story that took me seven years to write. It's uh, mi- about migrant laborers in the Persian Gulf. And it came out with a Chicago Quarterly Review. And um, it is it is an important work for me as personally as an artist and also kind of socially. Um, and given that Falsipides, it is, it's not in Falsipides, but it's it's on my website at etraz.net under stories. It's called The Price of Paradise. And um, there's, it's, it's extremely heavily Islamically, culturally influenced. I think that I just let myself go. I was like, let me have Islamic culture, mm-hmm. you know, in here. And so um, I, I, I encourage people to check it out. It's free, so you can totally read to. it. I'm having seen some of the condition of some of the migrant labor in the Gulf, I'd love to read it. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, you know, I've driven them around. I picked them up. I would just chat with them. Wow. I would kind of, because I, I was living there for a little bit, and... Uh, have tea with them, and you know, because it's it's crazy, and it really is. Um, Folks from the subcontinent, mostly, or yeah, yeah mostly. Yeah, yeah. But you know, the other thing it, it actually taught me, and I I would I don't want to miss this point, is that it made me more aware of like worker conditions in the United States, mm-hmm. because ultimately you kind of see that we are in a more sophisticated version of that, right? Hmm. So, like when companies here will. Uh, hire you through a contractor right. so that when they lay you off they don't pay you unemployment right? Right. Like, so it's the principles of oppression kind of are the same that's right, it's just gilded yeah, yeah. Just obviously nice their physical finish. toil is so much greater and I, and I really couldn't like, I had to be a witness to that, you know, yeah. so I um, that Price of Paradise story I really encourage and you can pass it around it's free, I mean it'll be on the Chicago Court Review website but they've you know they're cool with me like putting it on my website already. Great. So. No, I mean, we'll make sure to post links to not only your uh, book signings and, and whatnot, but also where can people find you online? You mentioned your website. If you could repeat that, and yeah, I have two Twitter. websites somehow. Okay. This is aliatraz.com, and then there's like the bigger one, which is etraz.net. Okay. Um, and then uh, I guess face Facebook. I mean, you know, people just hit me up and add me, and I'll start liking their stuff. And I'm just you're on Facebook. You, you have a Twitter. I do have a Twitter, E-T-E-R-A-Z, just at Taraz. And we're back. So, uh, Pervez, that was a pretty good good, good chat, I'd say. I had a great time, yeah. That, that, that was really uh, – I mean, I, I'm frankly, I'm looking forward to the opportunity to have him on and just uh, whether he has a new book or not, just to sort of just, uh, you know, talk off with him. And he has such wonderful insight on not only the Muslim community, but just I think the uh, – you know, we you know I know offline we were talking about just um, – you know his 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 uh, his attempt to try to bring people who are still sort of practicing artists and trades and things like that to and telling their stories and I just find that fascinating. So uh, had had a great conversation. Absolutely, and uh, that this is definitely something we're going to continue on as we uh, carry the show forward. We're now bumping right up against uh, our one-year anniversary, and certainly we've had uh, a very diverse uh, list of people uh, who, who've graced us with their presence, so we're, we're open to carry that forward. 
just a reminder, please do hit up iTunes and or Stitcher Radio. Do write us a review. Let us know how we're doing. Leave us a star rating. Any little bit helps. Also, if you have any questions or comments, you can uh, contact us via our Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash Diffuse Congruence, or uh, via diffusecongruence at gmail.com. Either way, uh, send us a line. We will absolutely read your, your note on air, and we'll uh, are on our air, I should say, and uh, do, do our best to, to give you an answer that, that uh, is worthy of uh, the time you took to write to us. So uh, on behalf of my colleague, Pervez Ahmed, my name is Zaki Hassan, and this is the Diffuse Congruence Podcast. We'll see you next month.